Good morning. What a delight it is to see oh, so many faces with us this morning. I'm the Reverend Sarah Lawal. It is my great honor to serve this beloved community that I haven't seen for five whole months. It's really lovely to be back. Thank you. Maybe those of you newcomers who I haven't met yet, some of you I introduced myself to, I have been on sabbatical. So uh, no one has seen me for five whole months. So it's like being, uh, it's like a college reunion, really. It's just so exciting. I was like, I'm going to make our service late because I can't stop saying hi to everybody here. It is really beautiful to be back together again and to see so many of you and to see so many new faces that I haven't met before. Welcome, so glad that so many of you have sought us out during this time and, and found a home here for yourself. And I do hope, newcomers, that you will um, take some time to come and say hello to me after the service if I didn't get a chance to meet you before because I would really love to get to know you as well. Everybody else, yes, I want to see you too, and I want to give you hugs as well. It'll be a long receiving line, I'm so sure. And welcome to our virtual community out there. It is also wonderful to know that you are there and that you are worshiping with us. So I invite all of us to take a moment, turn towards our cameras, and wave to our online community, recognizing that we are more than the bodies that are in this room each Sunday together. And um, you know, I thought I would spy on you a little bit more during my sabbatical, but I only tuned in one time to watch my friend Reverend Jenny give her sermon. But it was really fun. And I will confess something to you. As I watched online, uh, the thought that I had to myself is, wow, this is really good. <laughs> what we provide in a worship service for an online experience is pretty spectacular. And it makes me so proud to be part of a community that's dedicated to making the experience vibrant and meaningful in person and online. That has been um, one gift of COVID. Whether you're joining us today for the first time or you have been a member since this congregation's early days, you are welcome here. Whatever fades you have known, if any, whatever your heritage, you are welcome here. Whoever you are and whomever you love, you are welcome here. We seek to make love visible in the world, to build a beloved community, nurturing spirits, lifting hearts, broadening minds, and enacting justice. If that call speaks to your heart, you are welcome here. In the spirit of that mission of building beloved community centered around justice, equity, compassion, and interconnection, let us take a moment to acknowledge our gathering upon native land. As we gather together, we acknowledge that the land upon which our church and homes exist is the ancestral land stolen from the people of the Shoshone Bannock, the Shoshone Paiute, Coeur d'Alene, Kootenai, and Nez Perce nations, along with many other tribes whose names have been lost in history. We acknowledge that our presence here today is founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. With this acknowledgement, we wish to demonstrate our ongoing commitment to the work of dismantling the legacies of settler colonialism. We honor indigenous peoples' connection to the land and support their right to sovereignty. Amen. For those of you who might be joining us for the first and second time, we, we also hope that you will stay connected with us and that you'll visit some of the resources that are out in our entryways. There's an opportunity for you to fill out a newcomer form. For those of you online, we'll put that link to the newcomer form in the chat so that we can stay in touch with you and you can start to connect with all that is happening here in our fellowship. We have a beautiful new coffee area, I understand. <laughs> I've missed the grand opening, so I am excited to experience it with you today. Uh, because of the COVID numbers, though, we are inviting people to grab a cup of coffee and take it outside where we can have our fellowship time together out in the courtyard. 
I do have a few announcements for the whole of the community. You know, next weekend is Boise Pride Fest, our annual pride parade and festival. And our congregation has had a long history of participating in and supporting pride. And so we're inviting you to join us in those efforts next weekend. We will have a booth at the festival and we still need some support in that booth, both on Saturday and on Sunday. So if you have some free time and would like to sign up, please see Nancy Harms over here and uh, she'll help you get signed up. We need some face painters. Even if you don't think that's your jam, you'd be surprised. It's not that hard, I did it last year. And as I was sharing with someone today, Pride Fest is one of the most joyous experiences that I have had here in Boise, so go and have fun. I will tell you this, however. Sadly for us, for me, maybe not as sad for all of you, the parade is at 10 a.m. on Sunday. So. To all those wonderful progressive churches out there and those ministers who have to hold down the fort, <laughs> I will be here, but I would invite you and encourage you to please go march in that parade if that speaks to your heart. And do not worry. Call that church for the day. Go do that. Be with other boofers who will be there. Show up for progressive religion that stands on the side of love for our LGBTQ community. There's one more event that I want to highlight for you. It's a homecoming celebration for my post-sabbatical return. It's a Milestones event hosted by our Committee on Ministry, Saturday, September 17th, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., all ages. Bring a picnic. We'll provide drinks. And we're hoping to have volunteers that will make stone fruit desserts. Oh, please, that sounds delicious. I know who those pie makers are out there. Please. I love pie. If that, if that works for you, go. So we hope to see you there to really celebrate the milestones that happened for all of us in the last months while I was gone, so I can kind of get myself reconnected to all that's been happening in your lives and in the whole of this community. It's our practice here at the fellowship to donate 25% of our unpledged plate offering each month to support one of our social justice ministry partners out in the community. And this month in September, our ministry partner is the Interfaith Sanctuary, providing emergency shelter and wraparound programs and services for people experiencing homelessness in our community. And we're just delighted that the Interfaith Sanctuary finally got its conditional use permit for its new building there on State Street. But yeah, you can applaud. <laughs> And it's still not without contention and some challenge. And so the partnership that we have had with them has been, um, this congregation was one of the founders of the Interfaith Sanctuary oh so many years ago. And that partnership has been really meaningful for us. So it's wonderful that we're able to support the expansion and the support. We wish we didn't have to. We wish it didn't need to exist in our community. But we do everything we can to, to support the work that they do. We no longer have a special offering moment during the service, a collection time, and there are so many ways that you can give. You can give online at our website. The QR codes on the bookmarks out in the entryways will take you right to the giving page, or you can just deposit your gift in one of our boxes right inside these doors here uh, any, any time that you're here, and especially on Sundays. This congregation's generosity allows us to make a con continued difference in our community in so many different ways, and we thank you in advance for your generosity. Each month we take on a spiritual theme for the month to extend and explore together, and this month's theme for September is belonging. And today's service in which we have a beautiful sermon by our own Nancy Harms, I'm delighted that I can ease back into Sundays a little bit without having to write a sermon, because I think I might have forgotten how to do that. Uh, this service today really explores wrestling with the mystery and the challenge of belonging, especially in these times. So as we enter into this time of worship together, I invite you all to take a breath with me. Fill your body with breath knowing that our breath connects us to one another, to our bodies, to this planet. Our breath offers us the opportunity for stillness, to tune in to our spiritual center, 
and listen deeply to our heart's own longing. Many of you know that this poem prayer that we recite every morning was authored by a wonderful colleague of mine, the Reverend Dr. Kendall Gibbons. And this year during our General Assembly, Reverend Kendall suffered a stroke. And so she's doing well, she is recovering, but I want to lift up and offer these words in her honor this morning. Thou art the song of my heart in the morning. Thou art the dawn of truth in my soul. Thou art the dew of the roses adorning. Thou art the woven whole. Thine is the grace to be steadfast in danger. Thine is the peace that none can destroy. Thine is the face of the need-riven stranger. Thine are the wings of joy. Thou art the deep to the deep in me calling. Thou art a lamp where my feet shall tread. Thy way is steep past the peril of falling. Thou art my daily bread. Thine be the praise of my spirit uplifted. Thou art the sea to each flowing stream. Thine be the days that are gathered and sifted. Thou art the deathless dream.
beautiful, beautiful song. I'm so delightful to see Ren's face and hear their voice up there. Each week we light a flaming chalice, a symbol of our free faith, a beacon of hope, love, and justice. We join in this lighting in solidarity and community with thousands of other Unitarian Universalists lighting chalices today in churches, homes, and worship spaces, reminding us that we are connected to one another in a larger community of faith and love. As we light the chalice here in the sanctuary, we invite those of you joining us online to virtually light your own chalice in your space and then share with us in the chat where you have lit your chalice this morning. With our collective chalices lit in all of our spaces, we offer you this call to worship adapted from Reverend Jacob Trapp. To worship is to stand in awe under a heaven of stars, before a flower, a leaf in sunlight, or a grain of sand. To worship is to be silent, receptive, before a tree astir with the wind. To worship is to work with dedication and skill, and it is to pause from work and listen to a strain of music, to sing with the beauty of the earth, to listen to the still small voice within. Worship moves through deeds of kindness. Worship is the mystery within us. Come, let us worship together. Old Turtle. Our story today comes from, to us from the fourth principle, which says, we believe we are free to search for our own truth and meaning to find and engage in mystery the way that works best for us. Once long, long ago, yet somehow not so very long ago, when all the animals and rocks and winds and waters and trees and birds and fish and all the beings of the world could speak and understand one another, there began an argument. It began softly at first, quiet as the first breeze that whispered, he is a wind that is never still. Quiet as the stone that answered, he is a great rock that never moves. Gentle as the mountain that rumbled, God is a snowy peak high above the clouds. And the fish in the ocean that answered, God is a swimmer in the dark blue depths of the sea. No, said the star, God is a twinkling and shining far, far away. No, replied the ant, God is a sound and a smell and a feeling who is very, very close. God, insisted the antelope, is a runner, swift and free, who loves to leap and race with the wind. She is a great tree, murmured the willow, 
a part of the world, yet always growing and always giving. You are wrong, argued the island. God is separate and apart. God is like the shining sun, far above all things, added the blue sky. No, he is a river who flows through the very heart of, the th of things, thundered the waterfall. She is a hunter, roared the lion. God is gentle, chirped the robin. God is powerful, growled the bear. And the argument grew louder and louder and louder until... Stop! A new voice spoke. It rumbled loudly like thunder, and it whispered softly like butterfly sneezes. The voice seemed to come from... Why, it seemed to come from... Old Turtle. Old Turtle hardly ever said anything and certainly never argued about God. But now Old Turtle began to speak. God is indeed very deep, she said to the fish in the sea, and much higher than high, she told the mountain. He is swift and free as the wind, and still and solid as, the, as a great rock, she said to the breezes and stones. She is the life of the world, Turtle said to the willow, always close by, yet beyond the farthest twinkling light, she told the ant and the star. God is gentle and powerful, above all things and within all things. God is all that we dream of and all that we seek, said Old Turtle, all that we come from and all that we can find. God is. Old Turtle had never said so much before. All the beings of the world were surprised and became very quiet. The old turtle had one more thing to say. There will soon be a new family of beings in the world, she said, and they will be strange and wonderful. They will be reminders of all that God is. They will come in many colors and shapes, with different faces and different ways of speaking. Their thoughts will soar to the stars, yet their feet will walk the earth. They will possess many powers. They will be strong yet tender, a message of love from God to the earth, and a prayer from the earth back to God. And the people came. But the people forgot. They forgot that they were a message of love and a prayer from the earth. And they began to argue about who knew God and who did not, about where God was and was not, about whether God was or was not. And often the people misused their powers and hurt one another or killed one another, and they hurt the earth until finally the forest began to die. And the rivers and the oceans, and the plants, and the animals, and the earth itself, because the people could not remember who they were or where God was. Until one day there came a voice, like a growling of thunder, but as soft as butterfly sneezes. Please, stop. The voice seemed to come from the mountain, who rumbled, Sometimes I see God swimming, in the dark blue depths of the sea. And from the ocean who sighed, he is among the snow-caped peaks reflecting the sun. From the stone who said, I sometimes feel her breath as she blows by. And from the breeze who whispered, I feel his pre still presence as I dance among the rocks. And the star declared, 
God is very close. And the island added, His love touches everything. And after a long, lonesome and scary time, the people listened and began to hear and to see God in one another. And in the beauty of all the earth. And Old Turtle smiled. And so did God. Okay, so Nancy talked me into doing a little reflection. And at first I said no, but then I couldn't help myself. And I know, yes, I had a good sabbatical. I know many of you are wondering and asking this question. And as I shared with someone earlier, it was not what I expected. And I probably should have known that going in. And I will share more stories with you certainly over the coming weeks and months and, and have a, we'll have a sermon dedicated to kind of the whole concept on the 17th, on the 18th, right after our Milestones event. But our belong, belonging is our spiritual theme for the month, and sometimes belonging feels like a great mystery, I think, for most of us. We crave it really deep down, but that true feeling of true belonging often feels just a little bit elusive and out of reach, and it can oftentimes, especially in this era of social media, feel like everyone else has it but us. And sometimes it can feel that way even in church. We arrive here in this place seeking that feeling of belonging, but don't quite know how to get there. We're hoping people will talk to us, but we hold ourselves back a little bit. We don't always want to talk to people. We try to figure out who we have to be in order to fit in and then attempt to arrange ourselves accordingly rather than just allowing ourselves to actually be who we are, however we show up in the moment. A little bit afraid to let that uncertainty and fear and sorrow over the world come on too strong or our enthusiasms and edges of wildness come on too strong. And we forget that belonging takes time and effort and persistence to keep coming back and keep reaching out and to keep going within. Because contrary to popular belief, true belonging begins on the inside, not on the outside. Early in my sabbatical, I took myself on a week-long retreat to Holden Village. It's a Lutheran retreat center in the mountains of eastern Washington, right on Lake Chelan. It's a beautiful place, only accessible by boat. The village runs year-round with a full-time staff, live-in staff, mostly young adults taking a gap year or working through college. And during the peak season, summer months, they have all kinds of different programs and offerings. But during late April, those were somewhat limited. And this was this past April in the middle of that freak snowstorm, which added feet of snow to the ground. And I was only one of six visiting guests, and all the others were either former staff or family members of those on staff. And despite the fact that I was really excited and looking forward to having some time alone in the wilderness to reflect and to rest, I felt really out of place and really lonely. 
because you see we had these community meals three times a day and a few activities were offered here and there, a group hike, and some of them I participated in, and people would make small talk, but nobody really talked to me. And it felt very awkward and very isolating. And so I turned inward, and I spent most of the days alone, walking and reading and writing and doing yoga and walking again, and I was still in bed by 9 p.m. I even visited the pottery studio and the art studio and found great joy and delight in throwing pots and working on the pottery wheel, and I made one really awesome bowl. Pottery became something of a new and very soothing spiritual practice for me. And in all that time alone, I began to hear my own inner voice a little more clearly, wondering if I even belonged to myself. In the months leading up to my sabbatical, in the past year and a half, really, I lost myself, I think, sucked into the seeming never-ending challenges of life, into this kind of wilderness, like a, like a downward whirlpool spiral, unable to really find a way out. The saving grace for me during this time at Holden Village, especially for a minister, was that I was there during Easter week. So we had worship every day. I've never taken so much communion in my whole life. But I loved it. And it was the one place every day where I felt content and welcome, but also free and broken open, free to let the tears flow and receive whatever I needed in the moment, in the beauty of worship. And I felt connected to the people in the worship space, people I hardly knew in this shared experience, but without having to make small talk. And I'd look around at the faces, because we were small enough that we would do the pass the peace during the worship, and look into the eyes of others and finally see myself and see their smiles and receive their handshakes and hugs that said, I see you. It's going to be OK. Author and vulnerability expert Brene Brown has this beautiful quote about belonging in her book, Braving the Wilderness, which incidentally used to hang in the junior high room for quite some time after we had a little book discussion group on her book. So here's what she wrote. True belonging is the spiritual practice of believing in and belonging to yourself so deeply that you can share your most authentic self with the world and find sacredness in both being a part of something and standing alone in the wilderness. True belonging doesn't require you to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. The mystery of true belonging lies in those words. Whoever would think that being who you are would be so hard. I'd never thought of belonging as a spiritual practice before. But indeed, it takes work to belong to ourselves and to find sacredness in who we are and however we show up in the world and what we have to share and give to others in the world. And even though we sometimes forget that church, that place where we hope we might find that true belonging, is also a place composed of wonderfully flawed and complicated and beautifully divine human beings, including your minister. It's also a place where if we keep coming back, keep showing up, however we are, we might experience true belonging. It has been that place for me, and still very much is. May it always be so. One of the ways we tend to our belonging with each other is by acknowledging the many joys and sorrows that arise in our lives and sharing them with one another. 
there, I want to remind you that you can submit your joys and sorrows to be shared verbally aloud. You can do that online. You can fill out one of our blue cards in the joys and sorrows basket right there. And of course, those of you who are joining us virtually, we invite you to share your joys and sorrows in the chat. And we compile all of those and put them out in an email so we can all read them and connect with one another. I know that there have been a lot of collective sorrows in the time that I have been gone, many unexpected deaths arose, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge them for myself, that I was holding all of you and all of that grief with you as we lost beloved members, Mitchell and Martin and Carol and Tom. And that there are likely sorrows in your lives that I missed or that you've been holding on to. I want to take a moment to acknowledge those as well and to hold in our heart that we just received notice that Chuck Clausen passed away recently. He and his wife Judy were longtime friends of the congregation. So if you are holding someone in your heart this morning or a sorrow in your heart this morning, I invite you to speak that aloud into this community of love that we might hold it with you. May the arms of this community hold all our joys and sorrows, those named and those that remain silent and close to our hearts. May we feel the grace in the room, the grace that surrounds us, and be transformed by the spirit of life and love with a warmth to celebrate the joys and a gentleness to soothe our aching hearts. Let us breathe together. Fill your body with breath. Breathe into your sacred space, this sacred space, wherever you are. Breathe with this beloved community breathing with you. Breathe with wholeheartedness. Listen to what is calling you in the silence.
Thank you. How do we find joy in these difficult times? We like candles of hope and joy to push back against the sadness and loneliness. We gather together in community to gain strength from one another. We listen for the laughter of children. We find mystery in the ordinary. One of my early memories is going with my family to Buell, Idaho to see the Antique Festival Theater and the Ramona Theater. I believe the play was Moliere's The Learned Ladies. At intermission, they had filled the alleyway with jugglers, performers, and fabrics draped on the fences and lights. The alley was magical. The next morning, I accompanied my father to a doctor's appointment in Buell. After the appointment, we stopped at the theater to see and visit with Ditch Bowler, the co-founder and director of the Antique Festival Theater. The theater was filled with workers who were taking down the lights and striking the sets. We exited the theater with Dritch out the back. We were in the alley, and I was disappointed to see that it was just an alley. Where were all the magical lights and drapings I had seen the night before? I was mesmerized by the magic of theater, and I remember looking at the enchanted alley and how it was transformed from an ugly, barren, ordinary place. In a way, that's why we come to our church. In this place of love and support, of deep spirit and open mind, we peek behind the screen of illusions that distract us in our everyday lives so that we may catch a glimpse of the holy. When I look at what theater can do, I see what the Lakota Sioux call the great mystery, a power so incomprehensible that it's indefinable and inexpressible. The great mystery is a reminder that we have no idea what this ultimate reality is, but we do experience ourselves as tiny fragments of the universal spirit. In the words of Albert Schweitzer, the highest knowledge is to know that we are surrounded by mystery. Where do you usually look for answers? A mystery we are living through right now is the war in Ukraine, which has now been going on since February 24th for 192 days. Reverend Judith Meyer said, we calculate the cost of war in many ways. We already know the toll on life and the environment, the suffering and the sacrifice that always come with war. There's also a moral cost. The true cost of war is a burden we all carry, not only as taxpayers, but as a people whose conscience is heavy with the truth. In the story we heard Emily tell earlier, an argument came up amongst the animals and the beings of nature in discussing the elements of God. Old turtles stopped the arguing, speaking loudly like thunder and softly as butterfly sneezes, saying God is all things. She told them of a new family of beings that would be coming. And soon the people came, and they began to misuse the earth and its gifts. The people forgot that they were a message of love, and they waged war, killing many, and the plants and animals and the earth itself began dying. And once again, Old Turtle spoke up about the futility of war and killing and arguing. People will wage war, it seems, without thinking of costs. They do it because it's the only way they know. War is a way of life. Only an intervention, such as a change of a being's heart, can put a stop to it. Old Turtle took the opportunity to teach the beings. What is the opportunity with Putin or any other leader bent on war? What or who can change their heart? The playwright Bertolt Brecht survived the Nazi occupation in Europe. He fled Germany to live in Sweden where he wrote the anti-war drama Mother Courage. In it, he conveys with bitter sarcasm the resignation with which people accept war and the moral inertia it engenders. In Breck's play, Mother Courage, 
the quintessential archetype of a war entrepreneur, says, well, there's always been people going around saying someday the war will end. I say you can't be sure the war will ever end. Of course, it may have to pause occasionally, for breath as it were. It can even meet with an accident. Nothing on this life is perfect. A war of which we could say it left nothing to be desired or will probably never exist. A war can come to a sudden halt from unforeseen causes. You can't think of everything. A war and the, a little oversight and the war's in the hole and someone's got to pull it out again. The someone is the emperor or the king or the president. They're such friends in need. The war has really nothing to worry about. It can look forward to a prosperous future. War is a living thing, a creation of humanity. It has clever ways of justifying itself. It can easily find reasons never to end. We must begin to make peace right where we are, where we work, where we live, and where we go to church. Robert Fulgham wrote, peace is not something you wish for, it's something you make, something you do, something you are, and something you give away. Right now, we are witnesses to a war that was unprovoked, an invasive action that has the count countries on the edge of their seats. Are we on the verge of a nuclear conflict? How far will Putin go? I wonder, how is it going to end? I perceive Putin as a self-aggrandizing blowhard who has little consideration for the Ukrainian people, let alone his own. Is Putin saying what Mother Curry said? I won't let you spoil my war for me. Destroys the weak, does it? Well, what does peace do for him, huh? War feeds its people better. Peacemaking requires more than good intentions. We've seen too many roads to hell paved with them. The Ukrainian people are fighting for their very existence, for the way of life, for their democracy. What do we do now? What can we do about the war? Robert Fulgham wrote in his blog the first week of April, what can I do? At least this, to make sure that my corner of the world escapes safe from violence, that I serve justice wherever I can, and that I do what I can to encourage others to do the same. And if and when courage is called on for me, I will act with the same grace and spirit as Vedran Smolovic, the cellist of Terryevo. Smolovic caught the imagination of people around the world simply by playing his cello in protest in a dangerous and terrible place. Such unimaginable courage to bring music to bear as a shield against man's inhumanity to man. Julia played beautifully the same piece as Vedran, Adagio in G minor by Tommaso Albanoni. Can you imagine that being played amongst the ruins of war with people trying to hang on to a normal? The war, like our era, the pandemic, and our endemic, and the perpetuation of a big lie all look like they will never end. How many of you have said to yourself, how much longer is this going to go on? Aren't you tired? Oh, I'm tired. Tired of the prolongation of the other side's persistence that the election was stolen and downplaying the capital insurrection. When will they say that the big lie is a big lie? Tired of the deaths that have occurred that could have been avoided after this breakthrough of vaccines. Tired of a war and the senselessness of it. The war continues. Is it because Putin can't think of a way out? Reverend Judith Miles said of war, because we can't see any alternative, war with a life of its own finds a way to keep on going. In this perverse way, war becomes a moral option, self-perpetuating, resistant 
to protest. We become confused, tired, and resigned. Another true cost of war is the loss of confidence in ourselves and our ability to make a difference. At this time, I'm looking for answers in worship, finding mystery in veneration. We heard today's call to worship by Jacob Trapp, a Unitarian minister who lived from 1899 to 1992, who spoke of the mystery in worship. A religious experience is deeply personal. It is woven into our everyday lives. It's not about supernatural miracles that defy the natural laws. It's about the wonder, mystery, and grandeur of the natural laws of nature itself. Religion affirms a sense of wonder that is part of our human nature. I already said that, thank you. Religion nurtures spirituality whose ingredients include humility, gratitude, and praise a spontaneous sense of appreciation for life, to be given a mind and a heart and a mouth with which to give shouts of joy, as Mary Oliver said. That's why we need the poets, poets like Mary Oliver, who is very much in the spirit of Langston Hughes and William Blake. Let us look at the mystery and let us understand it a bit better. What a bleak world it would be to not have art culture, dance, color, music, the humanities. If the world were black and white, what a sad, dreary world it would be. It would be so stark. Can you imagine this world without Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, or Jackson Pollock's paintings, or Van Gogh's Starry Night, or Chubby Checker's Do the Twist, or Nat King Cole's Unforgettable? The imagination is that part of our humanness, it is what we show the world. People need to feel fulfillment and connection, the infinite possibilities of our own world. Blake said, the imagination is not a state of mind, it is the human existence itself. To see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wildflower, Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Reverend Frank Hall said, we need the truths of science to probe the workings of the world. We need the truths touched by mythology, poetry, music, and art to celebrate life, to stimulate all the senses, to be fully alive, to feel that sense of awe that is at the heart of religion, to probe the workings of the human mind. But there's something else at the heart of this drive. There is a sense of wonder, the sense of mystery, the sense of awe that is at the heart of science. And this is where science and religion meet and marry and do their dance. As Reverend Hall said, maybe it's the same thing that drives the butterfly to move through the different stages in order to sprout those wings. There's something that drives the rose something nearly conscious, or at least comparable to what we call human consciousness. I hesitate to make any assertions about God, but the drive behind every form of life on earth deserves to be acknowledged. It is at once the most obvious, natural thing in the world, and at the same time, it is a mystery. I've been asked if I believe in God, usually by newcomers, or visitors to our fellowship after memorial service. I can tell they are uncomfortable with our services, having little or no mention of God or the Bible. They seem almost lost, as if their loved one wasn't going to go to their heaven. <laughs> after I give a brief history of Unitarian Universalism, and that our congregation is comprised of many religious backgrounds, I respond that I personally believe in a connecting energy to all things. I would like to believe that there was something that was a witness to the creation of the universe, the world. Can you imagine what it was like to be there and see the Colorado carve the Grand Canyon? 
Thoreau said, nature is full of genius, full of the divinity, so that not a snowflake escapes its fashioning hand. Science teaches us how it all works. Religion at its best acknowledges that there's something beyond our capacity to know. Religion teaches humility. Religion celebrates the mystery and allows us to feel a sense of awe. Religion, in the sense I mean in this context, is an intuition, as Emerson said. It cannot be received at second hand. Reverend Frank Hall said, we don't need the ta to be taught to have a sense of awe. Indeed, religion can take away that sense of awe by suggesting we know all the answers. The religions of the world have such a bad reputation, it's almost necessary to stop using the world altogether and substitute the word spirituality for the kind of religious experience we mean. Isn't it the sense of mystery that holds us, bonding us together as a fellowship? I'm a member of this fellowship because this is where I can come to be awakened to the possibilities of a life well lived. I belong to this fellowship because I believe we do this as a celebration of the great mystery of our life. The mystery that tells us that despite our many different paths, we know we walk together as one common community, searching, sometimes struggling, to find meaning in the life that is ours to live today. I give to this church because this is where we sing Silent Night on Christmas Eve, where we dance at the solstice, where we walk the labyrinth, where we meditate on the way of Buddha, where we discuss what it means to simply but profoundly be human and humane, and where we lift our eyes to nature and beyond through our windows. We are all travelers. We meet for a moment in the sacred place to love, to share, to serve. Let us use compassion, curiosity, reverence, and respect while seeking our truths. In this way, we will support a just and joyful community, and this moment shall endure. May we always marvel at the mystery, stand in awe of the possibilities, look for answers as much as we look for potential, look for ways to savor the world, to laugh together, to find joy in life, to touch that place of peace inside ourselves, and to take care of our spirits and our souls. May it be so. Amen. Amen, Nancy, thank you. I invite you to join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation. Our prayer today is adapted from the great pagan teacher, Starhawk. Spirit of life and love, holy mystery. We are all longing to go home, to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned we can only catch glimpses from time to time. Community. May we find our longing in that somewhere where there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. May we find our longing in that somewhere where a circle of hands will open to receive us, eyes will light up as we enter, and voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. May we belong to a community with strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done with arms to hold us when we falter. A circle of healing, a circle of friends, some place where we can be free. May our time together be another step on our journey home.
In the name of all that is holy, we pray. Amen.
Friends, I invite you to place your hands over your hearts for our closing blessing. Stand as you are able if you so desire. The Freedom to Doubt by Paul Stephen Dodenhoff. The freedom to doubt, to question, to be content to live in mystery is central to this liberal religious tradition. Like the process of evolution itself, the path that we follow, our practice, if you will, is not easy or simple. It isn't without its dead ends or its disappointments. It doesn't guarantee that all our con conclusions will be final or that we will ever find an answer to all our questions. But also, like the process of evolution, it is filled with great expressions of beauty and awe that are sometimes born of great struggle and at other times comes as unexpected grace. Thank you. A reminder that a new coffee area is open to grab a cup of coffee to go. Please be sure to respect physical distancing and keep your masks in place as you grab your coffee and take it with you. Thank you.